we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsor, the Boyce Research Initi Initiative and Education Foundation. Boyce Astro provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. It's at boyce-astro.com. Okay, uh, with that out of the way, let's get on with the show. I'm going to end my screen share here. Uh, our first speaker is coming to us all the way from Leiden Observatory in the Netherlands. In the past, he's used some of the world's very largest telescopes to directly image exoplanets around nearby stars. Lately, his work has focused on searching for signs of gigantic ring systems around exoplanets, and it's these unusual exoplanets that he'll be sharing with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Matthew Kenworthy. Dr. Kenworthy? Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everybody for uh, signing on uh, to listen to our presentations today. So I'll go ahead and share. Hopefully that's working. Yep. Wonderful. Okay, so thank you. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is some work where the AAVSO has made a huge contribution uh, to the research I'm, I'm leading. Um, as mentioned before, my kind of bread and butter research is trying to do direct imaging of exoplanets by their thermal glow around nearby stars using very big telescopes. Uh, but this research has grown and become a larger and larger part of my research because for me personally, I find it absolutely fascinating and I'm hoping to convince you all here today uh, that this is an interesting new uh, direction of research in astronomy. So uh, this is an image of uh, storm clouds approaching uh, Sutherland Observatory, which is uh, where one of the LCOGT telescopes uh, is based and the Super Wasp array, which uh, uh, were part of the J1407 research. So uh, the, the kind of basis behind this is that um, one of the big drivers for NASA and ESA are to try and find uh, planets, rocky pl exoplanets in the habitable zone of nearby stars. Uh, by direct imaging. And this is extremely challenging because the reflected light fraction is one part in a billion or one part in uh, 10 billion or so. So this is very challenging if you want to see an Earth-like planet around a nearby solar-like star. But if you look around uh, the solar system and do a survey of, say, right, where are all the where's all the rocky stuff and the rocky surfaces, um, there's an awful lot tucked around uh, um, the moons orbiting around uh, gas giants in our solar system. So we have several dozen, uh, uh, several dozen moons and a subset of those are very large indeed and are spherical and have rocky surfaces. And um, if our, if our uh, gas giant planets have, exo -moon, have moons, then there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to find uh, exomoons orbiting around ex exoplanets nearby in the galaxy. And a huge, uh, a recent huge effort has been driven by David Kipping at C Columbia University with the hunt for exomoons, where he was looking uh, for the indirect signal of uh, exomoons by the variation that they impose on the timing of their transit of their uh, gas giant planets, which were discovered uh, using the Kepler space telescope. And also Rene Heller's done a huge amount of work on the habitability that uh, these exo uh, moons might have around their exoplanet. And if you scale up Jupiter and assume that the exomoons scale up in similar size, then you can get you know, Mars-sized, Earth-sized exomoons around very massive gas giant planets that we know exist. So maybe uh, finding where exomoons are would be very exciting too. That could be another place to search ultimately. So what we have is that um, we originally have a circumplanetary disk, uh, sorry, a circumstellar disk uh, when stars and planets form. Uh, and as you form little rocky cores, which are the proto cores of gas giant planets, they themselves form circumplanetary disks. So there's a smaller disk uh, which can be a large fraction of an astronomical unit in diameter, uh, formed around 
that uh, planetary embryo. So the picture I have in my head very basically is that you have a circumstellar disk with a circumplanetary disk formed around the planet. Uh, at some point after a few tens of millions of years, probably even less, uh, the circumstellar disk uh, is dissipated, leaving a circumplanetary disk. And then once the gas is cleared out from that, uh, you get moons forming within that uh, within that disk of uh, dust. And these moon cores clear out pathways, circular pathways around the circumplanetary disk. And the point is that these are much, much, much bigger than the rings of Saturn. The rings of Saturn are Roche lobe uh, uh, rings, which are just one or two radii of the planet. These can be hundreds of times larger. And the point is that these structures, depending on how long they exist for, these cast very big shadows. They subtend a reasonably large chunk of the solid angle of the star. So there's a chance we can see them in transit. And at some point, all the matter is accreted either into the moons or onto the planet or blown away. And then that huge blocking set of rings disappears and you just get uh, regular transits. So uh, the reason I got into this was because I was working with uh, Professor Eric Mamajak, who's now at JPL, and his speciality was finding young stars. And I'm interested in finding very young stars as a direct imager, because if you have young stars, then you have young planets, and the young planets glow in the thermal infrared very brightly. So I'm interested in taking pictures of young stars to look for young planets. And Eric is one of the world's leading experts at finding uh, groups of young stars in stellar associations, and one of these is called SCOSAD. And um, Eric and his then uh, graduate student, who's now a professor, Mark Picot, um, identified 200 young stellar candidates, and they confirmed their youth by using spectroscopy and the common proper motion as all the stars appear to fly by the solar system due to, their, uh, due to the sun's relative motion to them. So, out of all these stars, one of the stars is called J1407. This is about 17 mega years old. It's sitting slap bang in the middle of the Scosan Association. Um, they derived a kinematic distance, which was then confirmed uh, with Gaia a few years later. This was about eight years ago. And, um, they, and, and one of the ways you can confirm that the star is young is uh, young stars are like teenagers. They're young and spotty and they spin very fast. So what you can do is you can look for the light curve as the spots rotate in and out of view. You can see rotational modulation of the light curve as the spots rotate in and out and you can work out that these stars are spinning at like three point, uh, yeah, just a few days. And of course the sun is middle-aged. It takes about 30 days uh, depending on the latitude to uh, rotate once on its axis. So where can you get all these light curves from? Well, um, you know, if we see a transit of a planet in front of a star, you get this characteristic dip of one or two percent, which lasts a few hours. Uh, this has been exploited tremendously by initially by ground based surveys and then the uh, the Kepler and more recently the TESS are discovering thousands of new planetary transiting candidates and com many confirmed pla transiting planets as well. So this has been a tremendously successful method for discovering exoplanets. And these light curves are typically put online for uh, other researchers to look for. So I'm gonna show you light curves from two uh, surveys. So one is the SuperWASP survey, uh, which was uh, one of them is in South Africa, near the picture I just showed you. And this takes basically 30 second uh, uh, images every 30 seconds using telephoto lenses. And this has been tremendously successful in finding up to 100 transiting exoplanets. There was an earlier version which was more optimized for looking for long term photometric monitoring of variables, the All Sky Automated Survey. And this uh, maps the whole sky about once every three days. So, Eric sitting in his office one day. Uh, Mark comes in, says, I've been looking at all these light curves. There's something weird with J1407. And so what you have here is the data from ASAS in red and SuperWASP in blue. And he says, something weird has gone on with J1407. And now if we zoom into this, what we can see is that the star's bobbling along quite happily for about 10 years. And in April and May 2007, the star switched off for about a week. 
So what you're seeing here is that the light comes along, there's a little dip, there's a bigger dip, there's a huge dip, the star drops by three and a half magnitudes, disappears for a week, and then pops back again, and then a similar set of dips, but uh, reflected in time. And all of this, uh, all of this is real uh, data, there's no noise in it. Uh, so I got a, a graduate student, Tim van Verkoven. I said, can you look at the super wasp data and just check the processing? And he did. And this is a, a, a refined, optimized, uh, extracted light curve. And what you can see is that this star is a bit like my daughter playing with the dimmer switch in our living room. Uh, it's going along perfectly normally. And then uh, the, at every, little, every bit of these little triangles I've put uh, at the top, this is a zoom in and you can see that the light curve looks very, very weird. This is not a transiting planet. And this light curve goes on and on, up and down. At some point, the star changes brightness of by 50% in about four hours. It's extremely weird. And there is one of the largest, steepest gradients in the whole set. And this is one which has given me a headache for the J1407 system, which I'll refer back to. But this is what the star does. And since then, um, uh, we put out an alert in the AAVSO, and uh, Franz Joseph Hampsch has done a very wonderful and patient job and is monitoring this along with several other AAVSO observers. But basically, this star hasn't done anything since. It's just sat there quite happily for the past 10 years, much to my annoyance. So uh, Eric showed me this light curve and said, what do you think is going on? And he and Mark have been discussing this. So they'd gone through all the simpler possible explanations. So could it be an eclipse by a substellar companion alone? We know that many of the stars in the sky above us are actually parts of binary systems. So statistically speaking, it's probably a binary system. And it's like, well, no, we can't, be, we can't get to this very ordinary looking uh, pre-main sequence star uh, to have a substellar or a red dwarf or a brown dwarf or something to give that kind of eclipse. You can't get 95% absorption that we saw. Okay, um, maybe it's an evolved system. So the star system is actually very old. We got the age typing wrong and the primary star went off and evolved into a compact companion like a neutron star or a white dwarf. Uh, and the answer is no, the system looks young. Everything about it screams young. Um, and also uh, very young stars, um, also generate a small amount of x-rays because they're chromospherically active. So we don't see any strong x-ray source from material feeding onto a compact companion, but there is an x-ray source and it's consistent with something that looks like a young star. Uh, so you start going for the slightly odder explanations. Could it be a circumbinary or a circumstellar disk? Uh, no, uh, we'd see this thing in order to explain the rapid fluctuations on our long time scales, you'd have to have um, a large amount of very warm dust and we'd have seen that we'd have seen the dust glowing in the near and the mid infrared and we detect absolutely nothing the star looks very boring extremely chromospheric all the way so the next um least crazy explanation but which seemed to be consistent was that we thought that we're seeing an eclipse by a large ring system so there's the star in the middle uh there's uh unseen secondary companion J1407b and around J1407b is a series of rings and the rings are what transit in front of the star so J1407b the planet or the brown dwarf doesn't move in front of the star it's the rings the rings are large enough to block the star cover the star's surface in projection entirely so you can do a back of the envelope estimate, which is, of course, what many of us astronomers do. So how fast do you need to draw the curtains across the disk of a solar radius star in order to get the light curve gradient you get? If I take my curtains and I whiz them across, that kind of gives you a rough estimate. And it turns out the variability speed has to be about 33 kilometers per second. And here is the first thing which makes most astronomers head scratch. This is a big thing. If you can take that steepest gradient that I showed earlier, multiply it by 56 days, whatever this thing is, it's huge. It's 0.8 astronomical units at least in diameter, at least the cord we've cut across it. So it's big. And something that big we should see um, if, it, if it was a star or anything, of course, and we don't. So that's why we think it's dusty rings. It's rings around an unseen uh, secondary companion. I was looking at the light curve 
and I puzzled over to myself, well, how on earth, there must be some way we can get the information of what the rings look like. And so um, one day I had an idea and I realized that um, if you, because the star is a finite sized object, it's not like a laser pointer. Um, as the disc moves in front of the star, it tells you some information about whether the edge of the disc goes vertical here. So as the star moves behind uh, the, the ring at a constant velocity, you can see here because the ring's perpendicular to the direction of the star, the light curve drops quickly. But the same ring feature on the other side, because of the tip and tilt of the rings, it rises far more slowly. So I, aha, maybe there's a way we can do that. So basically I went off and measured the gradient, basically how quickly the light curve was brightening or dimming every single point in the J1407 light curve that I could get. And this is what I got. So on the X axis is time and on the Y axis is how quickly the star was switched off by whatever's moving in front of it. And if you stand back, if you lean back from your computer and squint a little bit, you can see that the gradients on the first half of the eclipse are slightly higher than the gradients on the second half of the eclipse. I went off and I played a bit with geometry and I was very rusty with it because it's been many years since I've had to think geometry. But I came up with an equation which said, OK, if I had rings which are transparent, opaque, transparent, opaque, transparent, opaque, opaque, the, for a given tip and tilt of the ring system, and the way it moves in front of the star, I can derive a um, maximum possible light curve gradient. And it turns out to be this black curve. So if the rings were black and clear, black and clear, black and clear, all the gradients should lie on that black curve. But if one of the rings is slightly transparent, you know, it's 50% transmissive, then it has to lie underneath that black curve, but it cannot be above the black curve. The, geometrically, it doesn't work. So this gave me a constraint. I now knew which way a ring system could be tipped and tilted. So with that information, I then went back to the original light curve and said, OK, uh, I tried to build a model of rings, which was consistent with the data we got. So on the uh, what you'll see with this animation, so this is all the way through 2007, everything is to scale here. So the size of the star is compare, you know, the size of the star is on the same scale as the rings that I fitted and below you'll see the model as it scrolls along. So the orange line is my uh, light curve model and the yellow and black dots are the photometry we had. And what you can see, and at one point the light curve pops up back to unity again. And you can see that the orange curve doesn't quite hit all the yellow and black points. It's close, sometimes it's good, other times it's pretty bad. But this is a very basic model and I was kind of surprised that the model worked as well as it did. OK, and then we see it finishing off here. OK, so uh, Eric and I said, right, we think it's a giant ring system. And this is a more honest version of that animation. So all the gray areas are where we don't have photometric data. So it was cloudy or you know, uh, the telescope wasn't running. Uh, because we were looking in the data, the eclipse had happened three years earlier, we only have one color filter. We've only got the super wasp uh, data to look at. So we have no idea what the nature of the material is. We've just got one wavelength. And, and also there is an awful lot of gaps. Basically we only have about 20% photometric coverage. So it's very hard that there are several ring models which sort of work equally well, but no uniquely good solution. So this is what we've got. Yeah, this is the data we had to work with. But once I'd gone with the idea of, oh, this is a giant ring system and it's, around a, it's orbiting around something which is orbiting around a young star, could we be seeing exomoons in formation? Could be, this be the how we caught the right time where these rings can either be formed by gravitational perturbations due to the material in the ring or there's a moon in there vacuuming up that um, place where the light curve popped back up to uh, not, uh, unity again. And if you take that width, you can back out how massive must that exomoon be. If there was an exomoon there, how massive would be? And it turns out it's about Mars mass. And if you scrunched up all the rings together and assume they're sort of the same dust density as Saturn's rings, then you get about an Earth mass of dust smeared out into that giant ring structure. So everything sort of hangs together. Now I was very worried that I'd be 
laughed out of all future conferences. But I've given talks about this to several pe several conferences with my heart in my mouth, and nobody's come up with a good thing that's killed off this theory. So at the moment, it's hanging on by the skin of its uh, teeth. Um, since then, several groups uh, have very kindly entertained this idea. And they've done some simulations and said, well, could you have such a massive ring system holding together for such a long time on this orbit? And I've thrown the kitchen sink at this. I've tried direct imaging. I've tried radial velocities. I've tried every single observational technique I can think of to try and find the rings or try and find the planet holding it together. And pretty much everything's been zero, but I've got interesting upper, upper constraints. Um, because we have a lot of photometry from previous years, uh, this thing has to be on an eccentric orbit, which is weird. Most of the planets in our solar system with our rings are in almost perfect circular orbits. Having it on an eccentric orbit pr brings challenges that the rings should be perturbed each time it uh, whizzes around close to the star. So uh, Stephen Rieder, who's a very patient collaborator with me, uh, said it has to be greater than zero, but then the rings have to be spinning the opposite way, which is weird. Uh, Zanazi and Dong wrote a very interesting paper saying, these wing rings can't be coplanar, they've got to be warped in some kind of weird way, so they sort of look like a Pringle crisp or something. And of course, we've had this wonderful, consistent uh, photometric monitoring from AAVSO, and we haven't seen another eclipse yet, but I keep my fingers crossed. Uh, I got a, a great student, Robin Mental, who went off and we kindly got access to the DASH uh, photographic plate archive, and it turns out J1407 was bright enough to be on photographic plates from the past century, which is absolutely spectacular. Uh, and it uh, was uh, scanned in, and so what we could do was we could do a trick called period folding, where we said, okay, we don't have continuous coverage, but is there any point where another eclipse of 56 days duration could have happened and we didn't have the photometry for it? And then you can say, right, so that's a possible orbital period that we've missed just because we don't look at the sky all the time. Um, and so this graph here shows you uh, the relative likelihood of finding, uh, of ruling out uh, potential orbital periods for the J1407 system. And what you can see is that there's a peak around 14 to 16 years. And just because of the nature of photographic plates and when they were taken, we can rule out with a great amount of confidence everything between 18 and 24 years. And then the probability goes up quite a bit just because we don't have that many eclipses in 100 years once you get up to 30 year orbital periods. So my last shot at trying to find something about this was to use the ALMA submillimeter telescope array in the Atacama Desert. So I wrote for three years in a row, I wrote proposals and I got rejected uh, by the TAC, which is fair enough, that's part of the uh, job as an astronomer. But the fourth time round was the golden one. Uh, they went off, they pointed all these submillimeter telescopes towards J1407 and uh, got this image. And I worked with uh, Pamela Klassen, who did a, who was very patient with me and helped me understand the data reduction she uh, did. And so we see a source. So I'm looking for the glow of the heat of the ring. So submillimeter wavelengths with ALMA. ALMA is fantastic at detecting warm and cool dust orbiting around stars and it's produced some exquisite images over the past five years. It's been truly spectacular. But the star itself, J1407, its, it's uh, chromosphere is too faint for ALMA. So we rely on the absolute astrometry of ALMA to get the position. And at J1407, we see nothing, but about a quarter of an arc second away, we do see a source. We see this brightness we predicted, 80 microjanskis for the ring system we predicted. So I was delighted when I saw this image first. But then horror set in because it turns out that that blob, that warm blob, uh, is just a bit too far for it to be on a closed bound orbit. And if you remember, I highlighted one of those gradients uh, with a red ring. And it turns out if you take that red ring and multiply it by the 10 years since the transit happened in 2007, you get the solid white ring. So one possible explanation is that it's a free floating planet with rings that just happen to move in front of a young star. Now, Eric and my collaborators all roll their eyes at me, but I can't rule that out with just one image from ALMA. So I have to uh, hope that the people at ALMA are patient with me and get another image. And if that thing is moving away from J1407, then we found a free floating planet. 
or what I suspect is I've got a background galaxy. I'm seeing a very high redshifted background galaxy, which is throwing out a lot of radiation. But time will tell. But this has kind of become the albatross around my neck. It, quite, it won't quite die a death, and I can't leave it alone. And I keep on coming back to J1407, and I look at the AAVSO light curve of J1407 uh, every month or so just to see what it's doing. So. Uh, I went off and did another project to look for circumplanetary uh, rings around Be uh, Beta Pictoris B, another planet. I didn't want to uh, spend too much. Uh, I didn't want to go into that project. It's another talk, but I wanted to point out uh, something which has happened, which is very exciting in the past year or so. So this was initially detected by the All Sky Automated Survey Supernova Network, um, which is a set of telescopes which are scanning the whole sky and looking for supernovae, which uh, fire off and then we can then follow up. And uh, back in December 2019, I was looking at Twitter and uh, Zachary Way, uh, who's working at uh, in the Assassin Network, uh, tweeted this image out and he says, hey, there's this weird star which has suddenly decided to start fading away. And I looked at that and I went, ah, we may have another ring system. I was being very optimistic about this because I'm starting to see rings everywhere. And sure enough, if you look in, this star's just been bumbling along quite nicely. And from previous data that they've got, this, star's, this star has been perfectly stable, has done nothing unusual for at least five or six years. And then all of a sudden, it starts fading by at least half a magnitude over a week or two. And so I was delighted because I then did, some, did my homework, had a look. This is uh, uh, yeah, a 0.65 solar mass star. Um, I looked in the infrared catalogs. There's no infrared access, so there's no warm dust floating near this, no eclipse in the previous 2,200 days. Eric uh, looked at the kinematics. So it's not a young star, but it's not terribly old. It looks about 100 mega years, and uh, we did some, uh, Eric did some lithium fitting, and it looks as if it could be around 220 mega years, but it's not old, old, old. So I was pretty excited about this. And because we caught this eclipse, I wasn't sure how long it was going to last. I was assuming it was going to last about 30 days or 60 days or whatever have you. But thanks to AAVSO and the observers here, we've been able to not only just get one band with photometric coverage, we've been able to get you know, six, ba six photometric bands simultaneously, and it's carried on consistently through to uh, up to and including last night. So the right-hand axis is data I downloaded this morning. And what you can see is that there's an initial drop here, which is coming down, and then this weird double peak, uh, Zach published the telegram, astronomers telegram and then um, uh, Josh Ham uh, started immediately observing it in uh, V band and so he got the jump on all of us and then I was able to get other collaborators to start imaging but what we have here is a complete light curve if we combine all the bands together which lasts over 370 days now and it's spectacular the resolute the time resolution is, is, is exquisite we can combine all these uh, light curves together uh, you can see the impact of COVID, unfortunately. So all the main telescopes are switched off in April or May. So the uh, LCOGT uh, had to shut down for a while, uh, but uh, AAVSO observers very kindly kept on following for as long as they could. Then the star set for most of the globe, uh, but I very kindly had collaborators working in Antarctic. In the Antarctic, they have a uh, large telescope called the A-STEP 400, and they very kindly took data during the uh, Antarctic winter until the object started rising again for the other observers to keep on following it. So I just wanted to say, yeah, uh, we got this beautiful data from the Perth Observatory with Craig Bowers and Rafiq Bourne, uh, exquisite photometry uh, from TG Tan and the Perth Exoplanet uh, Search Telescope, uh, Meckering Observatory, provided some beautiful photometry from the first part of the curve. And then we have the international network, the LCOGT. Uh, I was working with Edward Gomez and I put in a proposal and I've been able to continuously monitor as soon as it's above the horizon there. Uh, because we caught it just as the start of this eclipse happened, uh, I have a collaborator, David Buckley, 
who very kindly uh, got some discretionary time, and we have some high resolution spectroscopy of the eclipsing event at very, very deep uh, uh, during one of the deep minima. And what's interesting is that we don't see any gas. I was hoping that we'd see gas absorption, which would tell us something about the structure and the composition of the disk. As far as I can tell, there's no gas absorption in there. We just see this reddening absorption, which is characteristic of a dusty disk. And uh, just to list uh, uh, the other observers, you know, thank you so much from uh, to Franz Joseph, the road. Uh, telescopes have been providing great data. We've had DFS, NLX, and SDM, and other observers have been uh, contributing. And of course, the uh, All Sky Automated Survey has been following it with Zach Way and uh, Chris Danek, and uh, my uh, and other observers that other astronomers that I work with: Joey Rodriguez, Tabitha Bayajan, uh, Gary Sacco, and David Buckley, and uh, Mike Cushing we've been able to point some really big telescopes at this as well, but it's all inspired by the work and the data being taken uh, by the AAVSO. So zooming into the first part of the eclipse, we can do the same trick that I said earlier, these steepest gradients seen in Super Assassin and during the middle of one of the other deep dips, you can see this very clear divot feature uh, where the gradient increases. We can actually work out the transverse velocity for this is not as big as J1407, it's about five kilometers per second, um, which means that its orbital period is gonna be pretty long, whatever this thing is. Um, the infrared spectrum, um, Michael Cushing and uh, uh, Mike Rayner, uh, sorry, John Rayner, uh, they were able to get a spectrum with, an infrared spectrum with specs at the infrared telescope facility in Hawaii. There is no evidence of water ice. I was hoping we'd see some. I thought that would have been quite exciting, but no, this looks to be a dry system in transmission. Uh, I work with uh, Christian Ginsky at Amsterdam University, Amsterdam Observatory, and Alexander Bone is a graduate student I work with. He's doing great work. Uh, they were able to get some uh, direct imaging with Sphere. So this is a high contrast camera on the very large telescope down in Chile and we were able to get an image of the star back in uh, the beginning of 2020. And what we wanted to look for was any kind of stellar companions. Could there be a very long period binary and this is throwing material into the system. And basically we can rule out anything which is greater than about 13 Jupiter masses. There's a tantalizing sort of detection at about 20 AU, but um, just because of the long time I've spent in direct imaging, it's probably an imperfection in the uh, camera, sorry, not an imperfection in the camera. It's it, it's probably the way the system works that that might be a fake speckle. It's not a real planet or a, not a real source. So again, another image would confirm this or refute it. And because a uh, sphere has polarizer, uh, polarization capability into it, we could also see that there's no strong polarization signal. So there's no disk of hot, a hot, 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 uh, uh, dust close into the central star. So it seems to be floating on its own. So if we take that five kilometers a second, a um, uh, uh, telegram by Schaefer in at the beginning of 2020, they, uh, he sees, he took a dash photometry of J0600 because it was bright enough to be there. And there are three photometric points back in 1937 where this light curve seems to be fainter. So the star seems to fade. So that could sort of hint that the orbital period is about 80 years for this system. So if you take 80 years, and which is consistent with about five kilometers per second transverse velocity. So five to 10 kilometers a second multiplied by 370 days, the diameter of this thing's about 1.8 astronomical units. So that's consistent with the Hill sphere of something like Neptune or a Jupiter mass object. So all of this kind of hangs together. So what I think there is, is there's a more diffuse cloud of material orbiting this secondary companion. And within that, there's the ring system uh, sitting there. But uh, I'm still trying to understand the light curve and see if I can get a ring model which fits, which is proving to be a bit of a challenge. But those uh, features which go up and down rapidly are real and uh, they give hints as to the relative transmission of possible material moving in front. And the fact that this 
structure keeps on going on and contains detail uh, all the way throughout the eclipse implies that this is a flat, dynamically cold structure. So um, I was able to gather a whole load of data on this system because we caught it right at the start when the trans transit of it started happening. I've listed uh, all the things which I discussed here. And my, my tentative conclusions at the moment is that we're seeing an eclipse of a cold ring system, or at least a disk-like structure, which is almost certainly within the hill sphere of uh, unseen secondary companion. So I think something's orbiting around this star uh, at a very long distance, like 16 or 20 astronomical units. It's not going to eclipse again for many decades, unfortunately, but it's close enough that I could possibly get Alma to look at it and see if we can see the rings glowing in the uh, in the submillimeter uh, radiation. So no ice or gas absorption means that this is cold. It's sitting a long way out from its central star, and it seems to be very, very quiescent. Um, there's no obvious stellar companion to this star or worm circumstellar disk. And uh, given that we see no obvious previous eclipses lasting this duration, it means it's about an 80 year orbital period, or you could actually, it could be every 40 years and we just caught it on the second eclipse. We're not sure. We'll need to uh, continue monitoring it and uh, do more uh, imaging studies. And finally, I just want to say thank you so much to the AVSO and all your members and all your contributions. It's just been absolutely fantastic. I never thought we'd see this rich detail of uh, data, and this is fantastic because it allows us to analyze it. And because we see that the absorption changes as a function of wavelength, we know we can actually start measuring the size of the dust. You know, it's a few microns across. You know, it's scattering more blue light than red light, so we know it must be a, a dusty scatter. So uh, I hope to, in the next few months, uh, be able to tell you um, a much more complete story about this object. So uh, I'll leave it there and uh, thank you very much for your time. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Kenworthy. That was, that was an amazing presentation. Uh, I was especially impressed by that animation you showed at the beginning of the forming um, circumplanetary disk. That's just Wow, if I were doing photometry, I'd be, I'd be joining. <laughs> and... All right, uh, so our next speaker is a staff researcher at MIT. If you're a programmer, you might have used some of his work before because he helps develop and maintain astronomical software such as AstroPy and even the ray tracing code for the Chandra X-ray Space Telescope. His research focuses on young stars such as T Tauri and RWRIGI, and today he will be presenting a view of those variables across the wavelength spectrum and an argument for why AABSO observations of these young stars. Oh, um, Dr. Kenworthy, I'm so sorry. I just realized I, I forgot to read you the questions. I'm so sorry. Um, here, I, I'll, I'll go ahead. You have three questions. Uh, apologies, everyone. Um, geez. That's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we have a question from Michael Poxen, who uh, asked of J1407, uh, could this not be a forming planetesimal rather than a planet? Uh, so, uh, yes, it could be. Um, if, you, if by planetesimal you mean something much smaller than um, than, than a gas giant planet. The issue is, uh, whatever this structure is, it's very, very big. And usually the only way you can keep something propped up without it collapsing into a planet is to have all these structures orbiting a secondary companion. So a ring system is the most natural explanation to prop something up as large as an astronomical unit because gravity just kicks in and goes schlump, it'll just make it into a compact object very quickly. And the only things that we know of are rings around planets. So all the individual particles are orbiting around, around an object. Um, so uh, if, by, if by planetesimal you mean, could it be something much less massive than a planet? It's kind of unlikely uh, because it ha there has to be something at least a Neptune or a Jupiter worth of stuff in concentrated in the middle and a planet's the least crazy explanation. That makes sense. Um, all right, our next question comes from 
Tony O'Hanlon, who is also asking about uh, J1407. And he asked, um, could it be a massive cloud like an Epsilon Origi or a stellar eruption like with the recent Betelgeuse dimming? OK, thanks. Uh, these are good questions. Thank you very much. Um, so could it be a massive cloud? So it's it, it could be, uh, but with Epsilon Origi, uh, the dynamics of it imply that the secondary companion is stellar and there's a very thick, massive disk surrounding the secondary star in the Epsilon Origi system. So just the, the size dynamics are all wrong for it to be a star sitting there heavily hidden. And because this system is so close, our infrared telescopes would definitely see a star in there, even if it was heavily obscured. It would be ringing through in the infrared easily. Uh, could it be an out, uh, eruption of dust, uh, sorry, of dust forming in condensation, such as uh, the Betelgeuse dimming? We don't think so because this star definitely is not a red giant. It's not evolved. It, it, it walks like a duck. It talks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. It's a young star. And you don't see many uh, dusty eruptions just because you don't have the giant extended photospheric envelope, which is cool, uh, to, form these, to form the dust eruptions, which we think explain Betelgeuse. So we did consider it, but because you only see one event and then it's totally quiet for the rest of for decades, we've ruled that out. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question here, which is coming also from Tony O'Hanlon. Um, mm. And he would like to know, working on the basis of a true ring system, could gaps be caused by a few exomoons acting as shepherd moons, as in Saturn ring system, uh, rather than one gap corresponding to one moon? Yes, absolutely. So there are things called Lindblad resonances. So each time a moon in Saturn's rings go round, uh, anything, any material which is at an integer multiple of or injured divisor of that orbital period gets cleared out as well. So you can have one moon clearing out. You know, it's like a kid pushing a swing. It basically clears out sympathetic gaps within the ring system. So it could absolutely be that. Uh, we couldn't do that with J1407 because we didn't have the photometric coverage. What I hope is that I can reconstruct a model with J0600 because we've got complete coverage. It, either a ring system solution will work or it will not. At least we can answer it one way or the other. But then I can then look at the radial structure and say, are there any two to one resonances? So I'm really excited because I hope we can actually do that trick and answer that question. Yes. Uh, we have actually uh, just received a couple more questions while you have been answering oh, those. Okay. I'm going to give a few minutes to do those. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked, uh, how do you calculate the period of this type of planet around the star with just one eclipse in the light curve? Good question. We can't. So what we do is we can rule out all the eclipses, which it can't be. Because we, thanks to AAVSO and DASH, we can look at the light curve over many decades for these brighter stars. And if we see another eclipse, boom, we've got the period. Even if we don't see another eclipse, we can rule out possible we can rule out possible orbital periods. So what we do is we have a Swiss cheese diagram where we can rule out, well, it can't be three years, it can't be four years, it can't be five years. And so what we do is a process of elimination, hoping that we'll see another eclipse soonish. Okay, and uh, one last question comes from Gabriel Nigu, who asks, um, is there any periodicity in the variability like rotating moons? Uh, cool. So. Uh, for the moons themselves, we cannot see them. They'll be so tiny, they'll block an invisibly tiny amount of the star. We do see the light curve of the stars wobbling a little bit, and it, but it's because of spots on the surface of the star. It's nothing to do with the moons, if they're there or not. It, it's basically, the stars are young and spotty, so the light curve wiggles around by about 3%, which cannot be caused by an exomoon. It's got to be spots on the surface of the star. That makes sense. And it uh, looks like that is all of the questions that we have got. Um, sorry for almost cutting your Q&A off there. No, it's all good. And, thank, uh, you. thank you so much for your presentation today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, OK. Uh, <laughs> OK, our next speaker, you've already heard a bit about him. He's a staff researcher at MIT. Uh, he helps develop AstroPi, the ray tracing code for the Chandra X-ray Space Telescope, studies young stars, such as T. Tauri, R. W. R. Egi, 
And today, he will be presenting a view across the wavelength spectrum of these young stars and an argument for why AAVSO observations of these young stars are more valuable than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Moritz Gunther. Hi. Um, uh, before I say anything else, I need to check, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, so my name is Moritz Gunther. I do a lot of things in software. I do AstroPy, I do the ray tracing code, which is called Marx. I do, um, uh, and I try to use software for analysis, uh, where, uh, trying, to try, trying to come up with clever ways for using software so that we can do less, uh, more with less data. But uh, today, like I'm not gonna talk about the miniature details and how to do that. I'm gonna tell you how stars are born and how we know about it. And you've probably seen this picture of the, what they call the killers of creation in the background that I'll get back to. I wanna say that one difficulty of this webinar format is of course that I can't see all the faces and attendees. So I can't see if you're all nodding your head and ask me to go faster because it's all obvious to you or if you're all looking puzzled. Uh, so you'll have to put in a question or um, put in a question or comment in the chat if I'm moving too fast or too slow for you. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce uh, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna tell you how stars form and then I want to go through how we know that. Um, I'll, uh, uh, that that's both a scientific question like uh, we had in the last talk, you know, how we, when we have a piece of observation, how do we interpret that? Could that be an exomoon? Could that be a ring system? Could it be all sorts of that? How would you learn that? But also want to talk a little bit about how the process works, like how, um, how do we actually get the data? How's the, the community organized? How, how does yeah how does a scientific endeavor make those things uh, come together and at the very end because always good to finish off with some nice pictures i want to show uh, where in which regions of our galaxies of our galaxy and in other galaxies stars form um, because that's going to be a nice uh, ending and a nice summary okay uh, i want to say people call me an observational astronomer that means I work with data, I work with observations. I don't just work with computer models or just computer models are hard enough, but I do work with stuff that's observed, but I rarely ever look at the sky. And the object I work with most, RW Raja and uh, TW Hydra, although today I'm not going to talk about TW Hydra, I actually couldn't locate on the sky. I have no idea where they are because the instruments I mostly use are on board of the Chandra Space Telescope, and um, the XMM space telescope on the top. And then I also use the Hubble space telescope quite a bit at the bottom on the back, black background. But unlike when you do observations yourself, of course you don't go, you know, uh, look over the, the telescope to get it roughly in the right direction and then move it around and you find your object. Instead, there's a crew of dozens or hundreds of uh, engineers and telescope operators and schedulers behind every one observation. And so I don't, I, I'm much further away than any uh, observer who owns his own telescope. I'm so much further away, in fact, that sometimes, uh, yeah, I don't even know where the objects are in the sky or what the right season is to observe them because in the space telescope community, somebody else will take care of scheduling that. So uh, with that said, uh, my, my goal is of course to learn about the physics and uh, to understand how stars form and how stars go away. And so I wanna start and give you an overview about the life cycle of stars. Stars form in large gas clouds. Uh, they're clouds of yeah, gas and dust and, and the simplest uh, picture, right? That just contract over the, under their own gravity. And um, eventually like the inner bit compresses, compresses until it's hot enough to burn hydrogen and starts nuclear fusion. And then we'll get stars that shine for many millions, billions of years, depending on their mass. A small star like our sun is going to live for billions of years. Like our sun is going to live for 10 billion years, roughly, right? And stars that are M, M dwarfs that are even lighter uh, will live for, for 30, 40 billion years. But eventually small stars will run out of hydrogen and then they'll turn into red giant 
uh, the end of the red giant phase that throw off the outer envelope, the outer material that form this beautiful planetary nebulous. In the middle, we end up with a white dwarf. And if you have a larger star, then everything goes more, goes faster, they burn through the fuel much faster, they'll form a red supergiant, and eventually they'll go supernova, and depending on their mass, they can turn into a stellar mass black hole, or they could turn into a neutron star. And so this phase, just like Matthew who spoke before me, the phase that I'm studying is the very first phase. I'm, I'm looking at how stars form out of those stellar, pre protostellar clouds, um, uh, how they look at when they still have their disk, how they interact with their disk, um, those things. I want to uh, say a little bit about like, why do we care, right? Of course, we study star formation because we want to know how stars form, but there's a link to a few other to a few other broader questions. One is, and that's fairly similar to uh, the motivation that Matthew probably had and that he talked about in his last talk, right? We want to understand how planetary systems form. How do planets form? How do moons form? And one, one fundamental question is, of course, we want to know how our planet, how the Earth was formed. But since we can't just go into a time machine and go back 5 billion years, one way to study these questions, how planets form, is to look at regions in the sky where planets are forming today and where these disks are forming today and where we can study the properties of those disks and the way gaps form in those disks and all sorts of things. Um, and so we need to find star forming regions for that and then we can identify what looks possibly like a young sun did. And one a little more specific question is that in recent years people have found a lot of complicated molecules in space. Things that uh, are fairly close to biomolecules that life would form that, that that life could be made out of. And so one intriguing idea or question is that some of the building blocks that would start life on Earth could actually be formed in these clouds or in these disks and then frozen onto comets and rain down on Earth. And whether or not that's relevant to what happened on Earth, we don't know, but it's certainly an interesting question to look at. Okay, so stars form in these uh, large uh, clouds of gas and dust. Uh, this is an image, a multi-band image from the Hubble Space Telescope of the Orion Nebula Cloud that you may have seen before. Um, I've tried to put the telescope or uh, the satellite that's taken the images that I'm showing like at the bottom uh, is a little image. So that's the Hubble Space Telescope. So you have like a little better idea where the data comes from. And you see that these clouds are not homogeneous. They have structure, they have fronts in them, they have ionization fronts. Um, for example, over here, uh, you should be able to see my mouse pointing over here. You see like a hole that's opened up. Uh, the brighter stars sit over here. And then there's a little, few zoom-ins here. These are the, what they call the proplutes. So each of those has like a young star in it and then had its disk around it. But because it's so close to the bright old stars that sit in the center of the star, that illuminate the disk and the outer layers of the disk evaporate. And so you get like this gas envelope, but the, the mass, the wind that comes out of those old stars and the energy that comes out of those old stars is so bright that uh, it pushes the, uh, the material that comes out of this stellar system back, pushes it to the behind and that gives these thing kind of a shape like a droplet that's bright on the front where the material is burned off. And so we know, like from looking at, let's say, the Orion Nebula cloud, that many, many stars, in fact, like the majority of stars, forms in these dense molecular clouds where you have massive stars which have high radiation, hot radiation, and burn off the disks of the stars around them, like of the younger stars. And so one thing that's not quite clear is how that influences planet formation. Like, um, can you only form planets when, when you're a star that's born in a cloud like Taurus, where distances are large and the next like bright star is far away, so you can hold on to your disk for much longer? Or do you form planets, or if you form planets, do you form them in a different way? If you are a star that's born in one of these massive clouds where radiation uh, and stellar winds like blast off the material around you in, in much faster, much faster succession. So um, to make it a little simpler, here's a cartoon of the phases of star formation. And of course, uh, 
we've just talked about one of those phases in quite some detail. So in the beginning you have these dark clouds, right, that I had pictures of and they're dark when there are stars behind them. But when you look at the right wavelengths where these clouds emit, mostly in the infrared, then they'll be shining bright. Um, gravity makes mostly, essentially gravity makes all these tiny pieces in the cloud pull each other together. And so you get clumps forming as it falls together. In the first phase, the gravitational collapse phase is pretty fast. Um, it falls, falls in, but because there's always some motion and there's always going to be something that moves like a little forward or a little backward, when you then compress it from the very, very large scales, from parsec large scales, and you compress it by factors of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 into like a a star, like a tiny concentration by mass, even a very, very small initial motion uh, will have angular momentum, some turning. And that because that angular momentum is conserved, uh, that means that as you compress it, it starts spinning faster, faster, and faster. And that's how these disks form. And of course, we know that because we see this and because all the planets in our solar system go around the star all the same way in the sun. And there's not you know, one like this and one like that and one like that. They're all moving in roughly the same plane because they're all formed in the same disk. And so this disk initially stops any further accretion because the star needs to have a way to get rid of this angular momentum. It needs to like somehow get move this turning stuff out um, otherwise, it would get faster and faster and faster. And eventually, it's going to be so fast that it breaks apart or that it can't contract any further and can't get any more mass. And so what happens is that these young stars often form powerful outflows. They form jets that essentially shoot out on the top and on the bottom. And these jets are rotating, carry away that angular momentum. And so material can slowly can fall in from these envelopes onto those disks. And then some of it falls from the disk onto the stars. So it's kind of a two-step process where at first the cloud first forms the disk and, and a protostar. And then uh, once, once the rotation starts, the material passes through the disk and slowly moves inwards through the disk and then falls from the disk onto the star. Um, in the beginning, that's very hard to see because you have this envelope around it. So you can only see it like in radio wavelengths on the far infrared uh, or on the, the hardest X-rays. But after a while, that cloud gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and you can see the stars directly. And then you'll have stars um, like the ones you just talked about with some cloudiness around it and maybe some outflows in a disk around them. And then eventually, you're going to form you know, rings in it and, and protoplanets in it. And then you get rid of the disk, and you'll end up with a planetary system, maybe just like our own. Um, this is a look at an accretion disk. This is my favorite object and the one I've worked at the, best, the most, maybe, TW Hydra. Uh, I didn't do this observation. Sean Andrews did in the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in, uh, here in Cambridge. They used ALMA, a telescope you've heard about a little bit about. And so uh, what you see is that this disk is face on. It just happens so that we see like the disk essentially from the top. The star sits in the middle here. Here's a zoom in, the star sits in the middle. The disk doesn't actually reach down to the star. There's a gap in between. And then you get the inner edge of the disk and maybe some moon or planet or something that opens up this gap. And you get other rings further out, uh, which is you know, what uh, Matthew just talked about. But even in this inner disk, you see like connections between the disk and the star. And we expect that because at some in some way, that material needs to go from the disk to the star. And that's a process that I study. I look at this very inner bit of the how the star interacts with the planet and with the, with the disk. Uh, how does matter that comes from this, how does it fall into the star? What does it do to the star? Does it like heat it up, cool it down? Like well, what's happening there? That's what I'm looking at. Um, in order to see that, we often have to combine observations from different wavelengths. I mean, I work for the Chandra X-ray Center, so I do a lot of X-ray observations. We use the UV, the optical, the infrared, the radio. And we also often have to combine different techniques, like we have to do images, like I've just showed you. Uh, we do light curves, like the AAVSO often does, and um, we do spectra. Uh, in fact, like most of my work is based on spectra. Um, as, a, as a reminder, you know, it's uh, important to keep in mind that the Earth's atmosphere doesn't let all wavelengths of light pass the atmosphere. So the visible light 
the ones that we see with our eye and that actually most, I would argue most of the astronomical observations are done as one of those wavelengths that pass the Earth's atmosphere very well. And so while we do have to worry about uh, objects that aren't high in the sky, right, but when they're close to the horizon, we do worry about the air mass and we do worry about refraction and we do worry a little bit that fact that it makes our stars twinkle and the images are not quite clear. By and far, you can observe in these wavelengths very well with ground-based telescopes. Um, but in the in large parts of the infrared and in X-rays and gamma rays and the ultraviolet, the Earth's atmosphere blocks essentially all uh, transmission, which is good because if the X-rays that come from the sun mostly and from, from other stars and from space made it down to the ground, we probably all have died out from skin cancer like long, long ago. But on the other hand, that means that in order to do those observations, we need to start satellites, fly them above the atmosphere and use those for observing. And doing that is unfortunately incredibly expensive. And so there is uh, about a handful of satellites, two big ones, the Chandra X-ray Observatory and XMM, the X-ray Multi-Mirror Mission. Chandra is, uh, is a NASA satellite and XMM is an ESA, European Space Agency satellite that are the absolute workhorses of extra observations. There's a couple of smaller ones. There's an Indian mission, Astrosat, that's uh, currently up. Japan has launched a couple, and uh, the US also has one or two smaller ones um, that can be used for extra observation, like SWIFT, or there's currently an instrument that's mounted to the outside of the, called NISA, mounted to the outside of the International Space Station that observes X-rays. Um, but uh, many of those are specialized instruments that only work for fairly bright objects, whereas the stars that we are looking at, or that I'm looking at, are faint things. And so uh, all X-ray data that I'm going to show you is going to come from XMM and Chandra. Um, here's uh, photos or renderings of them, uh, how those things look like. And you see like a commonality, right? They all have uh, all have solar panels to power them. They all have uh, a lid at the end um, that closes, uh, works in Chandra, uh, works as a sunshade to keep the uh, instruments cool and keep the mirrors cool and it also I mean you need to you need to protect the mirrors and you protect the inside while you launch until you're in the vacuum of space so they all have like these these doors beside in Chandra this is the side where the light comes in there's uh, four mirrors in here and then Chandra is about as long as a school bus roughly 10 meter focal length uh, and the cameras sit over here an X-ray telescope, one problem that you have is that you can't build lenses of reflective mirrors the way we do that for optical telescopes or the way John, uh, the way the Hubble Space Telescope works too. Because if you were to build a lens or a mirror, traditionally you would just X-ray the lens, right? The X-rays would go straight through. So instead what you do is you need to have what's called a grazing incidence mirror. That means you have, have an... an very highly polished piece of glass where the mirror, the X-rays come from the side and then just bounce off, like just barely changing their direction. So the angle under which the X-rays hit the mirror is only about one degree, or between one and two degrees. And that means these mirrors are very, very heavy because you need like huge masses for, for tiny areas. So um, the, the, the useful area of Chandra is about, uh, it depends a little bit on the energy, but it's, uh, uh, about this. So for spectroscopy, it's about this. It's four square centimeter. You know, it's an aperture. If you look at the oxygen seven line, which is um, an energy region that I care for a lot when I look at young stars, the effective area is about a telescope that's you know has a diameter of one or two centimeters in the optical. So that's tiny. And yet, Chandra costs a billion dollars to build and fly, or a few billion dollars, depending on how exactly you count, there's some difficulty in accounting. But, um, so in X-rays, we can only see things that are bright and we often have to integrate uh, and expose very, very long before we get enough signal together. Um, so uh, yeah, and then there is multiple instruments in the back cameras so you can switch out to different types of cameras and you can either use gratings in there to make a dispersed spectrum or you can just take an image and make a direct spectrum. Here are some images from the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, when I made this talk, I didn't know exactly what Matthew was saying, would be saying. So you know all about disks, of course, already. So these are disks from the side. There's a star behind that you can't actually see. 
Uh, this is again a disk, what the, the light that peaks out here, that's not the star itself, the star is too small like that. But what happens is that the star sits in here, like under this black, in this black ring, this black ring, this, that's the disk from the side, and there's material over that. And so the star illuminates like this uh, material that's surrounding it, just like when you drive through the fork with your headlights on, the fork doesn't actually shine but it you can see it because it's illuminated by your headlights and so this material here and it's more extreme over here all this material in the wave bands that they used to make this image isn't shining by itself it's illuminated by the star that's hidden uh, in here end of this disk so young stars you know are surrounded by this these disks are made out of cool dust and these disks are here as one of these proplutes shown in larger detail. Again, they're clearly influenced by those close and bright stars. That's something you can just read off from these images. Okay, we're going back to the Orion Nebula cloud because that's where most of these things sit. There's an optical image uh, from Dick Berg up here, and then a uh, Hubble image down here. Where the Hubble image is made by combining several different lines. So there's a it's made with narrow band filters and there's an iron line in there and a sulfur line in there and each of them has a color and that altogether gives us the structure uh, that we see here. Okay, uh, I want to show you this movie now that's made by Chandra so I'll just stop talking and let you watch that for a little bit. What you see here is about a month of Chandra observations. I'm going to play it again in a second. Um, it's about one month of Chandra observations of the Orion Nebula cloud. Each of these dots is a star. And what you see when they go up and down, what you see is flares going off, similar to flares on our sun, except many of those are much, much more powerful. In the middle, you have the trapezium stars, and then you have uh, this streak here. It's not an astrophysical object. It's an artifact from how Chandra reads out its CCDs, its detectors. So that's, like a, that's a readout streak. Um, images, the, the size of the dots, all these are point sources. The size of the dots is depends mostly on how bright the star is because and, and how far out you are. If you're in the middle, Chandra's imaging quality is pretty good. So it's about half an arc second, the size of a point source. But out here, everything is going to look fuzzy because, just because that's the mirrors uh, give us um, an image that is less sharp on the outside. And the color decodes the energy of these sources. So sources that have very hot x-rays are blue and sources that have soft x-rays are red. Okay, I'm gonna go back and forth so we can see it again. And you see sources popping in and out, that, like this one, for example, or here, there are several in the middle that are only visible for short periods of time that are too faint to see unless they have a massive flare going off. And so what it shows you is that in x-rays, these young stars are, I'll do it a third time. On in X-rays, these stars are highly variable. Um, the light output, the X-ray luminosity changes by often by orders of magnitudes in these flares. And that will do something to the inner disk. It can uh, go into the, penetrate the inner disk, it can ionize the material, can heat it up. I'm going to look for at two flares in a little more detail now. This isn't actually two flares from that data set. It's two flares from other from two other TTR stars observed this XM of Newton. Um, but this is an X-ray light curve. So at the bottom, you have the time in kiloseconds. That's the unit we use in X-rays. There's a second, there's a kilosecond and a megasecond, just that there's like there's a gram and a kilogram. Uh, people who observe in hours just don't understand that the real time unit is kiloseconds and what we think. So uh, a kilosecond, uh, an hour is 3.6 kiloseconds, right? So uh, about 80 kiloseconds is a day. So this is a continuous observation of a T-Terry star with XMM Newton for about a day and a half. And you see that there's a quiescent phase here with a very, very low count rate. And then you have this huge flare going off where that star is um, becoming about like 50 or 100, almost 100 times brighter than it usually would be. And it takes a couple of hours, maybe half a day until that decays back. And then we are reaching this quiescent flares again. And sometimes you have like a one flare going off and then a second flare happening. That's the same thing that's down here. There's a different star. You have like one flare going off and while that 
flare still cools off, you have a second one going off, and then there's just here's a gap that the data wasn't good. And you have like a third flare going off, and then that decays back down. And so a typical time for these flares is a couple of hours. Um, some of them are seen in optical light too. Although in optical light, it's not a factor of 100 in the light output, uh, it's less dramatic. And we are fairly certain that are related to the magnetic field in the corona because we do see similar things in our sun, except in our sun, it's not quite, it's quite as big or quite as dramatic, but it has the same shape. And we also know something about the temperature of the plasma that's emitting. So we can learn something about the physics and compare that to the sun. And so we know that this, which is an image a movie taken with SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, is essentially what's happening on these young stars too, except that on those young stars, it might happen uh, a little more violently. And I'm going back and forth so you see the movie again. So there's the surface of the sun and then it change the magnetic field triggers this hot plasma flaring out some of it falls back into the sun and then you actually see like bright spots appear that it hits the stellar surface and we see the same thing in, in young stars and some of it gets thrown off into space and i'll show it again and i want you to focus a little bit on these areas over here where the material comes back in and so you see like when after the flares it falls in and it hits the sun and there's another bright spots. And we think that's somewhat analogous to what would happen or what happens when material from the disk falls onto a star. Of course, in our sun, we can't observe material from the accretion disk fall into the sun because our sun doesn't have a disk any longer. We just have planets, right? But we do see material falling back into our sun, like in the movie that I showed you. And we think that that's a very similar process to how what happens when material from the disk falls into the star, except that in young stars, it's going to fall in all the time and cover a much larger fraction of the surface. So going back to Orion and Chandra observations of Orion, this is another large flare, but these uh, red and blue lines are a little bit indicative, like to guide your eye. What you see is you have this large flare, so you've seen them before, it's a rapid rise and then a decay phase over many hours. But if you look closer, you see kind of this like wavy pattern uh, back and forth, going back and forth. Here. There's essentially variability within the variability. And so we can, under we can understand that as a model where the loop, the magnetic loop is so large that it connects the star and the disk. And so this is a numerical simulation where you have that star, then you have a gap in the inner disk and that's connected by magnetic field lines. And in the beginning, when that starts, like this model, the plasma, the hot plasma, the shocks essentially slosh back and forth. And so that allows us to look at the time scale and the amplitude of this sloshing that tells us how long that flare is. And so from that, we know that these flares do connect to the inner edge of the disk. So the inner edge of the disk is magnetically connected to the star and then material flows along that. Young stars have magnetic fields and those fields do connect the stars and the disk. That's what we can learn from these flares when we look at it. There's other variability in other light curves we can look at in X-rays. And so we have, we have these accretion spots where when material, when we don't have a flare, material just flows along from the disk to the star. It's going to flow along like this, this same loop and hit the star. And then on that star, the same thing that you just saw in the solar movie happens, it, the star brightens when it hits. And so this is a light curve of a star uh, that V2129 off that rotates. There's images and how you have to imagine that looking on the top here that rotates. And this orangish area, here's one of these accretion spots. You see it's a lot bigger than what we had with that single flare coming back into the sun. It covers a few percent as a fraction of the stellar surface. And there's, there's also a flare happening here in between. That's a little confusing. But you see that when you don't see that spot, when it's on the backside of the star, it's faint. And when it rotates into view, it gets a little brighter. And so we can do the same. We can do these light curves in the optical. We can do this light curves in the x-rays. We can do these light curves in the UV. And when we take that all together, then we can study how the stellar surface 
heats up and we can study the temperature of these things and we can study how much mass falls onto the star so that we can say how long does it take for for all the disk to disappear does all the mass from this fall in the star does how, what fraction of it is left to make planets or what fraction of it is blown into space that's something we can go and measure from that uh, here's a numerical simulation uh, how uh, we may envision these uh, accretion spots to look like and so we think that it, there's not may not just be one or two accretion spots, but there may be like more complicated structures with tongues or so that connect the star or the disk. Uh, we pretty much know that it's not going to hit at the pole because it's going to follow those magnetic field lines, and there's going to be like a ring where disks where either spots form or, or where many one or several spots are. And so we try to build numerical models where we can simulate different situations in a computer and then see if that fits what we've actually observed. Okay, um, how may one of these observations actually look like and how, that's what I said at promising beginning, how does the AIVSO data help us uh, to do something about that? And so this is an observation of uh, T-Tau. T-Tau is the star that named all the T-Tauri stars. It's, uh, it's the eponymous members, people say, of the T-Tauri group. Uh, T-Tau yet is a little special. It's a more massive than most other T-Tauri stars. And so we think that the accretion that behaves a little different. And in order to study that in more detail, we've made done X-ray observations uh, where we see like the hot plasma on the the accretion spot as plasma falls down in that spot it becomes hot enough to shine in x-rays and of course we also wanted to know when the observation happens is there actually accretion or is there maybe a flare that we see or what's actually going on and so we asked you uh, the AVSO members for support for a campaign and these green data points up here those are all AVSO data points this is the optical the v magnitude between 10 and 10.6 and you see that it's not terribly interesting in the sense that um, there is like some up and some down but it's not there's no eclipse there's no uh, there's no huge huge uh, dip there's no huge flare going on and for our purposes that's ideal that's great so I hope that the people who made these light curves made these point for us uh, are as excited as we are that they don't see anything <laughs> Because what that means is that we can use all those different X-ray observations. We looked with XMM for three times and we looked with Chandra for one time. We can use all those X-ray observations together. The star has roughly the same luminosity. And that means it's probably in about the same state. There's a very similar amount of accretion going on. And so we can analyze all these things together. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to think that this there's no reason to think that this is physically very different from what's happening here and that's important because I said in x-rays our telescopes are actually very very small we need to add time for many many different exposures from a very long observing time together until we have enough signal to learn something from it and if the star changes underneath while like while we are still collecting photons to get enough signal to learn something about it then that's actually all everything's going to get a lot more difficult so this AAVSO light curve tells us that all the x-rays are taken in a very similar state. And of course, if you want to probe accretion, uh, the luminosity is good. And another great way to probe accretion is um, the H alpha, the um, bright H alpha line emission and to measure how much emission line there is. So there's a spectrum down here uh, taken by this particular one is from uh, Christian Pook. Uh, for from the astronomical ring access for spectroscopy, another amateur organization that I'm sure some of you are aware of, and took this beautiful spectrum of T tau. And what you see here is a huge emission line, and that's coming from the accretion spot. And these here, these are photospheric lines over here that come from, uh, from the fact that it's a star that's hot inside and cool on the outside. And we measure how much this accretion changes. That's another measure of how the accretion changes. Okay, and you see that it goes up here right after the channel observation. Um, but uh, the red are RS data points and the blue are from a telescope in Mexico, El Tigre. Um, and you see that's about like between 70 and maybe 100 or so. So it's, it's a little change, but it's not dramatic. 
But what it does tell us, it tells us that a lot of accretion is in fact happening. While when we look in X-rays, it looks, um, it looks, it's if we can measure the density of the mass matter and we can see how much it is. And from that, we can learn that for G tau, we don't have just a single accretion spot like the ones I've showed you before, but we have a very large region, maybe a third or even larger of the star that's covered. And so instead of having a single spot where it comes in, the accretion must like come in, it's probably coming over a much larger region and is distributed much wider. So accretion spots rotate with a star. We can see that in light curves. And some stars are the foot points of accretion funnels. That's where this loop hits the, the star itself. And more massive stars accretion, uh, like T tau itself, accretion might happen over larger areas. OK, another one, R.W. Raja, the star I'm currently working on. R.W. Raja is a binary star. It's a binary system. It's about 1.4 arc seconds apart. It's on a highly elliptical orbit that takes around a thousand years to go in. And a couple of years ago, RWR Raja had this curious uh, three magnitude dip in its optical light curve. Um, even for Titari stars, that's huge. And it lasted for, for months. And so here's one of the initial ideas what it could be. Uh, one of the initial ideas is that the A component sits over here, RW Raj A, and the B component just happened just, just 150 years ago. So it just happened to be on the closest approach. And so the idea was that that could change the structure of the disk and could take a tr trigger tidal streams between the disk and we would actually see the star through this disk material. And we saw that as a great idea, a great uh, opportunity to study this disk material and to learn what these outer disk is made from that usually isn't the star doesn't shine on. So it's very cold and you can't really see it. But if you could like through it, you could see if there's any absorption, you could study what it takes away from the stellar light. And we thought that was, would be a great idea. But uh, then it happened again. And so there's this initial dip over here. This is the AVSO light curve. And then it became stable again. And everybody thought it was fine. And then it dipped again and went up, uh, up a little, down a little, up a little, down a little, up a little, almost back to normal for a couple of weeks and back down and up again and down. And then, uh, you know, if there was a tidal stream, we've expected to be, be one stream and cross through it. So there's going to be something else. There's going to be something that happens in the inner edge of the disk. Um, and so, Many people have studied this light curve in quite some detail and, and uh, have some thoughts about what's happening in BFD. Uh, the ESO, the very large telescopes in Chile have looked, and um, uh, telescopes from Hawaii have looked, and we have also taken X ray data again. So, this is X ray spectra. It's the first and only X ray spectra that I show you uh, um, is RW of Raja. And um, while I don't expect everybody who's listening to be familiar with X-rays, like I think I don't have to do a lot of convincing to tell you that they look the the red and the black line look very different. The red one is how young stars normally look like. These lines, these peaks here, are coming from individual elements. So this here is oxygen. This is neon. Over here is iron. And you see there's a lot of emission over here and then very little emission over here. Initially, then when we observed in 2015, it was very faint. And when we observed it again in 2017, it looks very different. There's like where, this, where most of the emission usually comes from, we don't see anything. But then out here, where before we didn't see anything, we now see a lot of emission. This is very hot emission and this is coming from iron. And so the fact that there's this huge like uh, feature here, this huge bump in the spectrum tells us that there's a lot of iron in the outer layers of the star and the atmosphere of the star that wasn't there before. And so one idea how we could possibly explain that is that something happened in the inner disk that you have a planet or a moon or a group of smaller planetesimals in the inner disk, very close to the star and close to the inner rim and they smash into each other, they break apart and like the earth, they have an iron core. And that because they break apart, they make this cloud of debris and dust particles. And as those iron, as these, this core material falls onto the star, it evaporates and then shines in X-rays because it, it's heated up in the corona. And that might be one way of where that iron comes from. It's not the only explanation, but it's one possible explanation. Another idea is that instead of breaking a thing up, a big thing up like a planet or a moon that had like an iron core on it, it could be that we had like a bunch of dust grains that some magnetic 
structure in the disk also has trapped. And then again, like for some reason that suddenly gets released and starts raining down on the star. So one thing we want to know, of course, is how much iron actually rains down on that? Is that a small moon? Is it a small planet's worth of uh, iron? Is it multiple planets worth of iron? And the answer is we don't know yet because we don't know how long it lasts. We need to wait until it goes back to the normal state. And so we need to keep observing and see how long we see this extra iron that's, that's unusual and that wasn't there before. Um, I say I double your Raja today, but we do keep observing. Uh, there's some images up here, some X-ray images. This is RW Raja A, the one that's bright in the optical and faint in X-rays. B doesn't change much. The fact that it's fainter here just is just looks fainter. It's just because we didn't look as long. It's a shorter exposure. But you see, A is here. A is gone. A is back. A is gone. A is back. And so that's like similar to the optical light curve. This is the tip. And then down here, I show you the most recent, second most recent spectra. So I showed you before 2013, 15, 2013, 15, and 17. You see that it's very, very different. And we've kept observing. We also observed it in 2018, 2019. And in fact, in 2020, although the last observation in 2020 was only about a week ago. So I don't know yet what the spectrum looks like. I need to work on, on it. And uh, all I'm showing you here is that it's still changing, and I don't quite know what that means. Um, but we we look for we look for iron, we look for calcium, we look for silicon. We we try to find out if those elements that make up grains that make up planets like Earth-like planets is there's more of them, or fewer of them than we had before. This is the IAVS O light curve just in the last months. At the same time. Thank you very much for everybody who's done that. At the very same time as our Chandra data was taken. And so I need to take the Chandra data, look at what we find and compare it uh, to what it looked like in the AVS or light curve. But again, I'm glad that there's some variability, maybe half a magnitude or so, but I'm glad there's nothing super complicated happening because that means I can combine all the Chandra data that was observed on five different days and assume that it's all kind of a very similar physical state because if I couldn't combine it, I just wouldn't have enough data to do something with it. OK, so something happened in the inner disk. There's like a maybe disk warp or the disk change, or maybe an inner planet has broken apart or something like that. And we can use light curves and X-ray observations and UV observations to study that. Uh, I have two other things uh, that I just want to shortly touch upon because they look really cool and they're related, although I don't have time, don't want to go like very deep into the physics of those now. Uh, so I said that young stars often also have these powerful outflows that throw stuff out. And this is uh, one of them, HH30, observed with HST three times. And you can actually see like stuff moving in it. If you play that video a couple of times, like you see uh, features moving along so we can go and we can measure how fast they move. This is just a few more images um, from many young stars have those jets. We don't quite know how the mass gets from there that falls in, gets like turned out into an outfall, but it's a very common thing we see. We do see that in X-rays too. So this is a 5.5 day exposure. Uh, that caught us 150 photons, 150 pieces of light. Um, the stars up here, this blue red piece, and uh, we see uh, this large structure in X-rays too. And just to show you how that data looks like, uh, like like for real, uh, when I look at it first, like the, here's a star, it's another one, there's a jet, and you just look at this box where something is nothing there, something's appearing, something's there. Uh, that's, that's more like uh, what I actually work with. Um, okay, how do we do all that? I said I'll touch upon how we do that. This is my office where I used to work before the pandemic. Now I'm working from home. Uh, I said I never look at the sky or rarely look at the sky, right? I do essentially all this work sitting on my computer. Uh, I'll just want to give you a timeline for this RWR Raja project, which is one of the fastest projects I've ever done. We had the idea that or we saw that something was happening in the AVSO light curve. And then we wrote a Chandra proposal. Once a year, you can suggest targets for Chandra, always in March. Then essentially say, dear NASA, we want to know if RW or Raja just ate a planet. So we think we should look with X-rays. And that proposal we sent in in March 2016. Then there's a committee of people who reads all those proposals uh, and select some that Chandra will actually be observed. One out of seven proposals gets observed, and six out of seven proposals gets turned down. 
And that is because people have many good ideas and Chandra only has 365 days in a year. So we were lucky and people thought that our idea was a good one and Chandra should look. And so the next time the schedule is built a long time in advance. So the observations happened in January 2017 and not even a year after the proposal, exceptionally fast uh, for uh, space observations. And then we did the data, data analysis over the summer and spring and summer and uh, wrote some uh, wrote some code to do that and then wrote up an article which we submitted to a journal in December 2017 and then there was some back and forth with the journal that they sent it to a referee another anonymous scientist who reads it and says I think that's pretty good but you should explain a little better why this or you should also consider that light curve and have an explanation for that something like that. The journal accepted and published that in 2018. And four of the co-authors, the bottom four here, Frankie Dubois, uh, Ludwig Logy, Steve Rao, and Siegfried uh, Wannerbeke are AAVSO observers. So when I downloaded the light curve, I looked at the who were the observers who contributed the most. And that's a group of those four who did most of the light curve that I used in that paper. So I contacted them and wrote them an email and asked them if they were interested to become co-authors in this article. And they decided to do so. So they wrote like a section about their observations and. Um, read and commented on uh, and, and helped like refine everything else we had written about the optical dimming of RW Raj associated with an iron rich corona and an exceptionally high absorbing column density. But as I already said, the optic ob obvious question is then how does it go? How long is that iron there? So we proposed again in March 2018. It was observed again in November 2018. And it wasn't quite bright enough to learn anything new. So we asked again and was observed again in uh, 2019 and now in 2020. So this follow-up paper is not yet published. And so this only took two, two and a half years roughly from, from the original proposal to want it's published, which is exceptionally fast for space. And so for those of you who have helped me out with more recent observations, like in Titao or in RW Raja, I just ask your patience, right? I'm not, I'm not asking for help from the AVSO and then don't use it. It just sometimes the timelines, the way these projects work uh, and, and until everything is falling together uh, often takes many, many years. And sometimes I have, you know, I need to look back and then they were a forum topic on the AVSO website where I originally explained what was going on. And I'm, I'm never sure if the people who subscribed or who did the data originally, if, if you ever look back that many years later to see what it's good for, but I try to, to, leave, a, a, to leave a note and explain that. But it, uh, it just takes a long time because so many pieces need to happen and fall into place. So most of my work is uh, programming computers. I write code like this uh, and I read what other people have written about their stars, what other data has been taken. Um, I would say that about a third of my time is spent writing proposals and uh, or reading papers. About a third of my time is spent like writing computer code, and about a third of my time is uh, spent like talking to other people and trying to find out, uh, trying to come up with ideas, and trying to get that all together and then write it into an article. Then we uh, tell people, tell the world about what we do, and what's it good for. So. Uh, we, before COVID, you know, we used to go to conferences. These are pictures from a couple of conferences. Uh, we have either those posters or where people get together and, and give talks. Uh, we write in publications, already said that this is, um, yeah, that today they all just appear online. Uh, but uh, when I started 10 years ago, they were still printed in papers and we communicate a lot uh, with each other. And we do things like like right now, where I try to explain to the people who did the original data or to just the interested public what it's good for. Okay, I'm almost done. I just want to run through like a couple of slides of images where in the universe and where in our galaxy now the star formation that I talked about so much actually happens. Um, it uh, happens around the sun in an area called the Gold Belt that has all the star forming regions in it Perseus, Taurus, Cygnus, Serpens, Ophiuchus, Lupus, Orion, and Taurus. And they just form this curious pattern uh, on the sky that's due to the structure of the Milky Way. Um, this is said one of the, the pillars of creation that I had in the very beginning, one of the most famous Hubble images about 7,000 light years away in the Eagle Nebula. And uh, these, these are, of course, the dark clouds here with stars forming inside that you can't see, whereas the top of them is illuminated and kind of burned away from the young bright stars that have already formed. 
There's much larger regions than that. This is what they call a mountain soft star formation. It's an observation in the infrared with Spitzer Space Telescope. This is the pillars of creation to scale, right? So, so this entire region fits into this tiny Bing. So many of these, uh, uh, and and each of these has like stars. There's tens of thousands of forming stars in here. So each of those regions, these regions come at very massive scale. In fact, they come at scale so big that you can see them in pictures on external galaxies. Um, an image of the Milky Way, the black regions are not, as I'm sure you're all aware, it's not where there's no stars. The black regions, in fact, are these dark clouds uh, that block out the stars behind them and where stars are forming right now. Um, in the optical, it's black, but if you look in other wavelengths, for example, in the infrared or in the radio, this gas, this dust is cool. So it absorbs optical light, but it actually emits and shines in uh, uh, molecular hydrogen on in the infrared. And so these regions that are cool, that are dark clouds in a normal optical light image shine brightly in the infrared. And we can use that when we look at other galaxies. So it's looking at other galaxies from the outside, you see these dark clouds here from the side. These are star forming regions right now. And then these blue stars, these blue regions on other galaxies, those are young stars versus these yellowish population is older stars. So these are these arms, the spiral arms is where stars cloud. And, and if you look back into the early universe, like many, many billions of light years away, we see that galaxies back then formed a lot more stars than they do today. And I'll finish just with a couple of other examples, right? There's Sombrero Galaxy, where you look on the side and you see there's dust, another edge here, galaxy on the edge. And then this is infrared, where the dust is glowing. So this is again, this is a picture of the Herschel Space Telescope and all everything that glows here, cool dust gets regions where stars are forming today in other galaxies. Okay, stars form in large molecular clouds. They're surrounded by a disk. This is the disk in this disk, planets form. They often drive powerful outflows and that happens today in our Milky Way and other galaxies. And we put together observations for many different things. Lastly, I want to just say a few words, right? I've, I've used AAVSO data for much of, not all, but for much of my research. I've used it most importantly to analyze the science to understand what's going on. But there's other crucial, I mean, that's obvious. Right? That's, that's what light curves are for. But there's other crucial pieces of data we get, for information we get from the AVSO. Like it's sometimes we use it as a, or it helps if, if bad weather, is, if weather is bad in one place, the AVSO has so many people helping out, it's unlikely that there's bad weather everywhere at the same time. And so it pretty much guarantees if, we, if enough people help us that we're gonna get something and learn something about what those stars are doing. Sometimes, uh, we don't know yet much about the star, but we can use the light curves to look for promising objects. So we can see if there's in uh, RW Raja, for example, we do, it did see that the light curve changed. And then we started to ask for Hubble uh, and Chandra time to do X-ray and UV observations of that too. So we, uh, we use that as a motivation of what other telescopes we might want to look at. And sometimes you use it with Chandra and HST to look and see when we look, because Chandra scheduled so long in advance, like I asked for that in March, and it's not going to be observed till March the year after. Like who knows if the star still looks the same way. Whereas if I can go back to the AVSO light curve, then I can say, no, don't observe it right now. Can you do it a couple months later? And can we wait a little until that star becomes bright again or faint again? Uh, so those are auxiliary ways in which AVSO data helps that. So I want to finish by thanking all of you so much uh, for putting your time and your effort and your money in uh, helping us, uh, helping everybody with astronomical research. And specifically for me personally, AAVSO data has been a great help for several of my projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunta. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we're just so glad to have you here. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and read out some of the questions. We've received quite a few. Uh, to start, we have a question from Robert Baker. This one was submitted towards the beginning of the presentation. And he asked, uh, in the star formation stage, are there times and regions that are discrete and can be discriminated from each other? In most star forming regions, stars form in stages. Yes, and so like a classic 
idea or scenarios that you have a first wave of star formation where you form some massive stars and massive stars only live a couple million years and then it goes supernova and so that and then you have a supernova wave a shock wave that travels through the cloud and those regions that haven't yet formed stars that shock wave is going to compress them and kind of get them over the edge and trigger the star formation there and if you form another massive star that could happen again um in practice, it's often there's other mechanisms that could work similar. But in practice, when you do the observation, it's very hard to measure the precise age of a star because they're in this cloud and there's this disk and there's accretion, they're very many the objects and a lot of go on. So it's rare that we can say for any individual star, uh, like these seven stars belong over there and those 12 stars belong over there. Like we can more say, oh, statistically, you know, we have seven and 12, but we're not quite sure which star is which. So there's probably discrete things, but it's very hard to pinpoint which star exactly goes there. Great answer. Thank you. All right. Uh, another question from Robert Baker. He asks, um, can you see Doppler shifts the compressions when the disks form? I don't study this myself, so that's a little, I'm, uh, I'm not sure I'm the best qualified person to answer that. And so I'm going to skirt around and say a few things that don't exactly answer this question, but go on the right way. Uh, Doppler shifts are very helpful. And so when, when the disk forms, you see in the line profiles, you see that some, some part of the fraction of the disk is moving towards us and the other fraction is moving away from us. And so in molecular hydrogen, for example, uh, we can observe the molecular hydrogen and we can observe molecular hydrogen at different temperatures and see that it has different velocities because if it's closer into the star it's moving fast and the cooler stuff that's further out is moving slower so we'll see different Doppler shifts from that. Um, and you do see the infall motion in, in radio observations. And you do see infall in Doppler, sh Doppler shifted gas in infalls on the disk. One complication is that you often see stuff moving in and out at the same time and then you aren't quite sure but you aren't there could be like if your star sits over here you could have stuff behind it fall going this way and stuff in front of it going that way so one of it would be blue shift and one of it would be ref shift, and then they hit in the middle but of course it could also be the other way around that you're observing outflows because you don't know if the blue shift component is the one that's behind on front of the star in, in many cases, because the geometry is a little messy. So we do see Doppler shift and it's fully consistent with this picture. But again, in every individual observation, you would probably say, hey, maybe this piece of gas moves over there too or something. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in many cases, not, it's not as clear as you might envision it should be, but, but that's okay. Right? We understand why it's the way it is. That makes sense. Um, okay, we've got, Another question from Robert Baker, who uh, would like to know, are the jets plasma forming? Are there magnetic fields associated with the jets? There almost certainly are magnetic fields in the jets because these jets are very collimated. They're very thin. If there weren't any magnetic fields, they'd be like more wide angle. They'd be like extend further. And you almost certainly need magnetic fields to get material to move that fast. They move as 100 kilometers an hour. So it, something must be pushing on them. Like they accelerate it and the, the stars aren't bright enough to do that with radiation. So they must be magnetically accelerated. Um, but we can't measure those magnetic fields directly because uh, we can't just put a magnet, a test magnet in there, right? So we don't know exactly what the shape of those magnetic fields is. There's a couple of observations in radio where people have measured polarized light and there's just a handful or so of these jets where magnetic fields have been more directly seen. And then you see sometimes they go along the jet and sometimes they go perpendicular to the jet. So there's apparently different modes of how you can do that. Um, we have another question. This one's from Gabriel Nigu, who would like to know, uh, he says, there is a recently discovered t tauri SAR that also shows rotational variability. Do you think it's worth being monitored? It's located in the M17 nebula. I don't know. <laughs> okay. um, I would have to know more about that star. So we know Ten, we know thousands of T-Tauri stars, right? Uh, in the fact that it's newly discovered could just mean that people never bother to look over there, or it could mean that it's very faint and we don't see a lot, or it could mean that 
it could mean that something exciting happened. Like if you had asked me, should RW Raja closely be closely monitored before this initial dip, I would have said, no, we know hundreds of Titari stars that all look the same and this one isn't particularly interesting. But then something happened and it became particularly interesting um, because these these many of these phenomena are time variable, but we can't monitor everything. It's hard to, and, and, and we don't know which ones the ones are to monitor. So. Um, the fact that it's newly discovered by itself doesn't mean anything. I think some Titari stars should be monitored because things are happening, but unfortunately we don't know once which ones. So to a certain degree, you want to get a range, right? You want to monitor something that's younger, something that's older, uh, something that has like a massive disc, something that has a thinner disc, so you can kind of cover them all. And all of those, you want to pick those that are bright enough so they can make it easily. And how to make the ideal list of Titari stars to monitor is that difficult question that I can't fully answer because people look for different things. Okay. Um, we have another question from Robert Baker, uh, who had asked around halfway through, how do you remove the heat from the telescope? Um, Unfortunately, I don't know which exact which telescope uh, that question was for. So for for Chandra, which is the one I work for, I can say the, the most of it, uh, the best of it. Chandra has radiators. Essentially, that's that's like a radiator heating. It's like a black piece of metal that hot. So there's coolant in there, or there's um, um, there's a, a metal structure, a heat transfer system that uh, where where you have heat in the inside. Uh, where, where the electronics sit, for example, it heats up and there's actually heaters to keep certain components at a specific temperature. And in order to get rid of that heat, you transfer it through, essentially it's just a piece of metal, strip of metal that's hot on one side, it's gonna be hot on the other side after a while too, that heats up this like radiator and you need to make sure that that radiator never points towards the sun, but points into cold dark space. And then you radiate away the energy. Uh, and heat management on Chandra is a very, a problem that's becoming more and more complex because the heat shield, like this silvery space blanket on the outside that you see in all the images is cracking or becoming dirty or we don't know exactly what's happening, but it doesn't work as well. And so often we now have situations where Chandra are looking in one direction and one side overheats and the other side cools too, down too fast. And so what you need to do, you need to have many short observations where after looking over here for a while, when that one side gets too hot, you essentially need to pick a different target and move Chandra around so that the other side gets heated up by the sun. And, and the side that was hot before, it's cool. So we have models where we can predict how fast which specific part of the spacecraft heats up and when people pick in which order, that's one reason why it's so hard to schedule and needs to be done so long in advance because you need to get that right mix of target, the right positions on the sky so that the right parts of the telescope heat up and cool down in, in, in the right order again. Okay, thank you. We have another question that says, um, are the schlafing events like alphane waves? Can you repeat the question? Uh, are the Schlossing events like Alphane waves? I don't know. OK. <laughs> um, let's see. We have uh, quite a few more questions to go through. So how about here's one from uh, Tony O'Hanlon, who says, um, for the protostar formation to be efficient, what process removes angular momentum from the disk and the material that is collapsing onto the star? Uh, are magnetic fields connecting the disk to the accretion spot more dominant in this process, or perhaps density waves from the collapsing material itself? For me, young stellar outflow seems to be relatively easy to explain, but not accretion slash inflow that feeds that outflow. And so the, if you accrete material through the disk, from the outside to the inside, you need to lose angular momentum continuously. And we are not quite sure how that works. Over the last 10 years, people have uh, the, the predominant paradigm that people think is most important is uh, has changed a little. Um, because we now understand that those disks are homogeneous, but they're hot on the outside and can couple to magnetic fields. And on the inside, we have something that's called like a, where they're shielded, where there's outer disk material shielding them from radiation. They're not ionized, so they can't connect to the magnetic fields. So it's all neutral gas. And we have like dead zones. And then like in between, we may have zombie zones or undead zones, depending on exactly which model goes. 
Uh, and so we now think that most of the motion happens inside and uh, that there is like a magnetorotational instability that, that stuff couples to the magnetic fields. Um, and the disc also drives a wind. And so it's not just that the jets that are coming from very close in, probably from the inner rim of the disc or the star itself, but the disc, outer disc drives a disc wind that we observe. You can see that in radio observations and it's, that's fairly easy to understand. So there'll be magnetic fields that thread the disc and that transfer some fraction of the material to the outside. And that material is rotating and takes with it the angular momentum that allows another fraction of the material to move further inside. Uh, so there's, uh, it wouldn't work without magnetic fields, but there's certainly also waves and, and uh, other instabilities uh, are involved in the process. So when I said, and when I said that uh, jets are hard, uh, I mean, we, we know that jets are there and they move the angular momentum. The question is, how does the material get from the disk onto the jet? And we do see the accretion. And the, the, if, we, if we assume that the star has a magnetic field that's roughly in a dipole shaped, then the magnetic field connects from the disk, uh, from the star to the disk. But how do you, how do you get like, material that follows the magnetic field and it comes from the disk and hits the star. How do you get that to suddenly turn around instead of falling into the star, moving away from the star and being accelerated at the same time? So we, we don't understand why there's jets. We just don't understand how that mechanism works like when you look in detail. So if it's very easy for you, Tony, then I totally encourage you to reach out to me and explain to me how, it, how it's so much easier than we think it is. Um, but I, I think I, I think what you mean is that like, we understand why it's happening in, in general, but the, the detail of how the magnetic field and the uh, material work uh, is, is not understood. Great. Good answer. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Bill Castro who would like to know, are observations of RW or Iga still needed? Um, the last Chandra observation was taken about a week ago. And be great if RW or Raj observations could continue just a little more so that um, we know if RW, like a couple weeks more, it doesn't have to be as dense as it currently is, like maybe, you know, just once a week or twice a week, uh, because we want to know if the Chandra observations that we have is, let's say we see the iron line again, which I don't know yet, but let's see that we see the iron line again. Then be very useful to know if that was the last day it happened or if at least in the optical light curve, the star continues to look like, like before. So presumably when we see the iron, if we see the iron line, the new data a week ago and nothing else changes in the light curve, then I would assume that we're going to continue seeing the iron line. We just can't look with Chandra every day right? because every observation is, it's, there's only very limited X-ray capacity. So a loose monitoring of RW or Raja so that we learn if something's, if it stays the same as x-rays and when it returns to the state it had before this crazy dipping happened uh, would be very good but it doesn't have to be dense monitoring okay uh, a related question we have here is from robert buckheim uh who says that rw or Ige is bright enough that it is within the range for some of our spectroscopy observers at a resolution of about 500 to 1000 in the visible range from 3,800 angstroms to 7,000 angstroms. He would like to know if spectra of those qualifications would be of use, and if you have any advice on what spectral features they should be looking for. When we look at t stars, the, the obvious thing to look at is H alpha, because H alpha uh, is going to, the equivalent vis of H alpha is very directly related to the accretion rate. And so uh, that has the, advantage that we just care for the equivalent which this to some degree you can learn something from the alpha line profile but much of the information is in the equivalent this so you don't need a very high resolving power like 500 to 1000 is fine um, and that tells you how much accretion is ongoing and you would think that if there's an inner disk if material falls in from the inner disk suddenly that wasn't there before that's iron rich then the accretion rate might change so far, we have not seen dramatic changes. Some of it might be because RW Raja is actually uh, is so deeply embedded. So I'll come back to that in a second. But RW, um, 
um, H alpha is the obvious line to look for. For most of the other lines, uh, what we would really want is kinematic information. So do we see inflows or do we see outflows, blue shifts or red shifts? And for that, 500 to 1,000 is not enough. For that, like let's say 20,000 or so is probably the minimum that becomes useful. And also, except for H alpha, most of those lines are relatively weak um, of the outflowing lines, like this. Uh, and then the, the spectral the, the features of the star, the photospheric features, you can also use to tra track absorption, uh, sorry, to track accretion, because if there's more accretion, you won't see the photosphere as much, like the lines will appear flatter. But in order to do that, you need to resolve the lines. So again, like uh, you would probably want to be like 20,000 or so. So H alpha, occasional monitoring in H alpha is going to be useful. With one caveat, uh, so uh, there's a Russian group um, uh, that um, has looked at RW Raja in its faint state and polarized right. And uh, that their telescope is big enough that they resolve RW Raja A and B. And looking in polarized right, they think that when RW Raja is faint, we don't actually see the star. All the light that we see is scattered. It's totally hidden behind the disk. And the, pol the light is polarized, indicating that we are just seeing we are seeing dust that illuminates, like when you drive to the night and, and your headlights illuminate the fog. We don't actually see the star, we just see the fog. And that unfortunately means if the light isn't even coming from the star, it's a lot harder to understand what exactly is going on. And it also means we have to worry a lot more about what RWRGB is doing, which is only 1.4 arc seconds away. Uh, which means that unless you have very good conditions, you're probably going to observe both of them. And so the, uh, in the AVSO light curve, we assume that it's always A and B, and B is evolving slowly. But B is also changing and evolving. So when you look at too much detail, uh, in, 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 when you look at too much detail, then, then you need to start worrying about those things too. Um, so for the spectra in particular, when you don't see, when you, the light curve tells us at least if it's absorbed or if it's not absorbed, but for the spectra, uh, in certain, depending on which part of the star you, that makes the light that you shine on the disk, you're not going to get like all the list from the star, you're going to see the some fraction that happens to shine in the direction that's reflected to us. So it's a little harder to understand what's going on. And that means like, even if you see something, we may not understand it. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Charles Cinnamon who would like to know, um, as an observer of RW Origi, uh, he would like to know if V is the primary band of interest or if B, R, and I bands help as well. They do um, because uh, more in the beginning because we've learned something about what's going on there already. And that's uh, so, it's in principle that color information is very good because it tells us if the star is absorbed or blocked. If you totally block out the star, let's say you totally block out half the star, it's going to be half as bright in all bands. But if you see it through a thin layer of dust, then the dust is going to redden it. So if you just have V band, you can't distinguish the two. But if you have multiple bands, then you can see if it reddens, this, if it, if it, dims the same in all bands, which means it's gray absorption. It's essentially a block of stones that are floating around it or a piece of disk that is so thick that it blocks it. Um, for RW Raja, since it's a couple of years old and we already have observations, multiple bands from the AAVSO and from space uh, where A and B are easily resolved, it seems that at least right now, that's all gray absorption. It's essentially a, a very thick disk or piece of stones a piece of stone or that that like bricks that float around it and block it. Uh, so unless that changes, uh, having one band having one band is very important. Having multiple bands is helpful, but uh, it's unlikely to give us anything new. It's just going to confirm that it's still behaving this way. Of course, if it changed to behave that way, that would be very useful to know. So we should occasionally look in multiple bands, but we don't need close monitoring in, in all bands. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Reza Amir Arjoman. 
I apologize if I butchered your name. Um, so we'd like to know what programming languages do you write your codes in? Um, almost exclusively in Python. So uh, there's another language that used to be very popular in astronomy. It's called IDL that was developed in the 80s and is, uh, has two main drawbacks. One is it hasn't been upgraded since for modern programming practices. And the other one is it's proprietary and very expensive. So while uh, universities can pay for a license for that, I can't just run it on my laptop. Um, whereas with Python, I can. And Python has this vast ecosystem of stuff around it where if I need something to make a website to present my results, there's going to be a package to do for it. So uh, a large fraction of astronomy today is done in, in Python, my code at least. However, um, there's some numerical simulations are not often because Python isn't fast enough for that. And um, so for certain things, we use Python to call it, but the actual piece of code that does the heavy lifting is, is often written in C or C++. So I, I personally work mostly in Python, but I know that just pure Python wouldn't be able to get everything that I need. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, another question from uh, Hanny Delee, who would like to know what is the minimum temperature to ignite the protostar? I can't answer that. For one, once I don't know, but uh, it's not just the temperature that matters, it's a combination of temperature and density. That's why it's so hard to make a fusion power on Earth. Because if you the density of the material is lower, you need higher temperatures to ignite fusion. If the density is higher, if you have a more, if you're on the inside of a star and it gets crushed together more, then you don't need quite as high densities. Um, and so uh, I can I can answer that in a slightly different way. So what matters to a certain degree is the mass of the object. If it's as light as Jupiter all the gravity compressing it together will never make it dense and hot enough in the middle to ignite hydrogen fusion. So you need roughly, that's a, the mass of a planet or brown dwarf is not enough. That's the definition of a brown dwarf. You need the lowest mass of a star in order to turn fusion on. However, in the young stars, uh, the very young stars, um, it's not necessarily fusion that fusion is going on the way as it's in the sun right now because compressing it you also you release a lot of energy gravitational energy by just compressing it's the same way as when you fill up your bike and you just pump hard enough that's compressing the gas is going to heat up like your air pump and so just compressing the it from gravity is going to give you enough heat to make the star shine so the protocellular stage uh, in, the, in the early stages, we often we don't see hydrogen fusion as in the sun that only may only set in as like 20 million years or so. But we see almost the same phenomena based on energy that's released just from the compression. I know that doesn't answer the, the question that the exact question that was asked, uh, which I would have to look up in Wikipedia or physics textbook. Um, but I think that answers what we need to know about this for young stars. Yes, thank you. All right, one last question uh, from an anonymous attendee who would like to know, um, at the protostar stage, do polar flows explain the Oort cloud forming? I'm not an expert in studying the Oort cloud, um, but the disks that we observe are larger than the Oort cloud. So we know that in many cases those disks are hundreds or thousands or tens, tens of thousands of AU wide. Uh, so we don't need necessarily need to do something very special. Like all our solar system, if you look back to the images that Matthew showed or the, the image that I showed of TW Hydra, all our solar system fits like in the very inner bit of that. There's a lot of mass out there uh, which, which is going to be dust grains and eventually form planetesimals that you can make most of the Oort cloud out of, out of it without invoking anything uh, too special to make it. It's also stuff can, uh, in that stage, because angular momentum is conserved, you can have these inflows and outflows of some part of the disk flows out, other parts of the disk flow in, and the angular momentum is exchanged between the two. And that that's enough. So I'm not quite sure if polar flows is, uh, I mean, polar and which, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what polar flows 
means exactly, but I think I've said what I can say about that, what I know. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to cut the Q&A off there. Um, I would like to send a huge thank you to both you, Dr. Zita, and uh, Dr. Kenworthy for sharing such wonderful presentations with us tonight. Um, I would also like to thank again our sponsor, the Voice Research Initiative and Education Foundation. Uh, Voice Astro provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals like the Journal of the AVSO. Today's webinar has been recorded, and the recording will be made available for free on the AVSO's YouTube channel. So be sure to check out our YouTube channel for a whole library of recordings and webinars just like these. And while you're there, go ahead and subscribe. Come on, help us game the media algorithm. Uh, and really though, the more people that interact with us on social media, the greater our educational reach will be. So this is just another way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, uh, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So if you're not a member, I'd like to ask you to please join AAVSO. I promise it's a great value. Um, if you're already a member, uh, remember to renew your membership. And of course, we would always be grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and it goes towards making programs like this come to life. One more thing before you go. Uh, after you log out of the webinar, you will be automatically directed to a survey. Please fill it out because we want to hear your feedback. This is a great chance to let us know what you would like to see in future webinars. Uh, do note, the survey is anonymous. So if you use it to ask any questions that you want to receive a direct reply from the AAVSO about, make sure that you write down your contact information in the text box at the bottom so that we know who to send the reply to. All right, finally, one last thank you to today's presenters from all of us at the AAVSO. We appreciate you.